Hi folks, and welcome to another Common Ground on the Hill concert. Our artist this week is Bruce Molsky, who is originally from uh, the Bronx in New York, but has become a fixture in the old time music and world music scene. Uh, many of you have heard his music before. If you haven't, uh, you're really in for a treat. This is really great music uh, with, with a lot of thought and uh, of course, skill behind it. And uh, we're very lucky to have Bruce. Uh, Bruce has taught with us at Common Ground on the Hill. In fact, this summer he will be teaching virtually with an amazing uh, lineup of fiddle instructors. So if you're in interested in the fiddle, uh, you'd want to sign up for Traditions Weeks to take lessons from, from Bruce Molsky, uh, among many, many other great fiddlers. Uh, we want to make sure that you understand that uh, we try to support musicians and artists the best we can through, uh, through our concert series. So be sure to look at the description here on YouTube and that will tell you how to donate. And these donations go entirely to the musicians. This does not go to Common Ground on the Hill. It filters through us, but it goes entirely to the musicians. And uh, even if you're looking at this concert long after it has happened in real time, uh, you can make that donation. So please do that. And you might want to take a look at all our other great concerts. There's some really good ones. And uh, tell friends about this. So without further ado, from the Mid-Maryland Folklife Center at Common Ground on the Hill in residence at McDaniel College, we give you Bruce Molsky. Hey, everybody. Thank you. 
so great to be here with you all, here in my house with you all out there, and um, with Common Ground, wonderful Common Ground. really appreciate them inviting me, having me on for this very virtual <laughs> sort of experience. We're going to take a, a little fiddle tour and various other instruments over the next little while, and um, yeah. And I kind of started outside of my own original music box, if you will. That was um, that was three fiddle tunes from the Métis fiddle tradition. And, uh, you know, music comes with a story. And uh, for me, the story has been meeting people and uh, having that social connection that, that is just so important to, uh, to keeping folk music going and keeping our community strong through art, if you will. In 1999, I met a fantastic fiddler from um, from the northern reaches of uh, of Canada. His name is James Chichu. He's a, a, a Cree fiddler who played music that he learned from his dad. And I started with one of one of his tunes called Elbow Swing, and then two tunes from uh, old pal John Arcand. And John was one of the people who uh, who kind of led me into how beautiful Métis fiddling is. He's a great, great fiddler, composer. Second tune is one that he wrote, and it's called The Grey Owl, and the third is one that he learned from his dad, and uh, that was called Victor's Number 39. <laughs> so we're going to take a little, little trip around various parts of the globe today, and uh, hope you enjoy this. Um, I'm going to bring it a little bit closer to home, but a song that probably had its roots in, in, um, in English music, but made its way into the southern mountains and into the hands of a lot of people. A lot of people love this tune, including me, and I hope you will too. It's a it's a love song. You can't go wrong with a sad love song, right? So it's the blackest crow. As time draws near, my dearest dear, when you and I must part. But little you know of the grief and woe of my poor aching heart. Each night I suffer for your sake, you're the girl. Thank you. 
light to me bracing And when the wind blows high and clear Bracing your love to me That I might know by your hand right How time has gone with thee Blackest Crow. Well, I'm going to take a little trip back into the <laughs> to the folk revival, which is kind of where I first wet my my water wings, if you will. And um, a lot of music came into view in New York City, and thanks to some of the original listener-supported radio that we used to get, WBAI, radio stations like that, and, and um, one guitar player who's playing always jumped out at me and who's, who I see as a model was, uh, was a man from the Bahamas. His name was Joseph Spence, and a uh, deeply religious man, a pipe smoker, stonemason, boat builder, renaissance person. I wish I'd had the opportunity to meet him, but here's, here's one of his pieces that I really love. It's called Bimini Gal. suspense nothing like him so one of the things about being at home is having all your instruments out and uh, and I do and 
Here's one. It's a good one. I also tend to bang them into each other a lot. Um, this is a fretless banjo, one I'm very, very, very fond of. It was made in the 1870s, all of it except for the geared machine tuners and the, uh, and the Formica fingerboard, which presumably came from somebody's kitchen floor, I'm really not sure. I never found any food stains on it when I got it or anything. But. Anyway, I'll play you a little bit of Roust about. Josh Thomas, who was recorded in 1959 in Hollins, Virginia, and uh, played also by, by the great Fred Cockrum of Low Gap, North Carolina, and, and others, and now me. <laughs> um, I want to play you another banjo tune, and this is, uh, it's not really a banjo tune. I've had the great pleasure of working with artists from other cultures over the years. It's been a, a huge, expansive thing for me. And um, one, of, one of them is a, is a Norwegian hardanger fiddle player, 
Hardanger is the national instrument of Norway. If you're not familiar with it, it's a beautiful instrument. His name is Anand Egeland. And this is a, a tune that's meant to be played on the Hardanger, which he recorded years ago, but somehow it ended up on my banjo. And uh, it's just kind of fun to play Clawhammer style. It's called Knut Ramlet's Hambo. to that tune. If I had the opportunity, I'd do it anyway. Miss my friends over there in Scandinavia and the Nordic countries. Um, bring it a little bit closer back to home here and play you a couple of, a couple of different versions of a tune that's made the rounds quite a bit and um, it's different with every fiddler you hear play it. I'm going to play you a a Georgia version and then an Eastern Kentucky version, which might sound kind of familiar to you, the second one. This is Bonaparte's Retreat. Thank you. 
play it though. Uh, so wonderful to have Bruce Molsky with us and before I uh, speak with Bruce um, I'd like to remind you all that uh, all of these concerts are supported by your gifts your donations that go entirely to the musicians to the performers and if you look uh, in comments uh, here on YouTube you'll see how to do that so be sure to do that uh, regularly often and more than you would even think so that musicians can stay on track during this pandemic. Um, so Bruce, great to have you here and great to hear you again. It's good to uh, see you, Walt. And, and uh, it's, it's been a while. And of course, it's been a while since we've seen very much of anybody. That's right. Yeah, well, Bruce has been with us a number of times uh, teaching at uh, Traditions Weeks and also concerts. But I have to ask, um, what is the hat? What's on your hat there? Oh, so, this is my favorite kind of ball cap. Um, yeah. This was a, actually a gift from a friend in Saskatchewan. This, hey. is the, this is the Saskatchewan football team, the Rough Riders. The Rough Riders. And, uh, I love I just, it. It's just my favorite cap. That's well, that's kind of it. And I also, you know, I've I've made a lot of uh, friends through the music in in Canada over the in, in the prairies in Canada. Yeah. And, oh, all over the country, and it just yeah, it makes me think of them. So yeah. That's one thing that, that uh, some people who follow folk music in the States don't know is that that border between Canada and the United States really doesn't exist except when you have to pass through the border. That there's a folk world that's completely connected to ours. Oh, it's and, so close, you know, and, and yeah. the kind of music that I play is, is it just is one of the strongest illustrations of that because it, 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 it emanates from people that came from, not from North America and didn't have those borders to worry about. <laughs> when they got here. Right, right. Well, that, that sort of takes us to where I thought we could you know, have a conversation um, for people who have never seen Bruce before or heard him. Um, the thumbnail sketches that he was part of the folk revival, as so many of us were, you know, we were excited by Pete Seeger and all that. And I think you were born in Brooklyn, born and raised in Brooklyn. Uh, right? In the Bronx. In the Bronx. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That's okay. <laughs> I, I don't take umbrage because you're not from New York. That's right. So the Bronx. And... Um, uh, and then Bruce was on the sort of the forefront of, um, uh, you know, boomers getting very interested in Southern mountain music. Mm -hmm. And uh, he became, in, for many of us, the touchstone of many of those styles, spent a lot of time with people there. Um, and then his world changed, his musical world, because of uh, people that he met along the way. And I think that happens to a lot of people that are involved in traditional music of any kind. Once you, you, you're sort of up and out from that and maybe touring, you come into music that excites you just as much as that original Southern Mountain music. So, so that, how did that happen for you, Bruce? And what are you into? Oh my gosh. Uh, well, these days I'm into a lot of different things, but, but in the beginning, you know, uh, growing up in the city, um, the folk music, as you say, the folk music revival when I was coming up was, was, kind of getting toward the tail end but we still had a a whole lot of uh musicians coming up from the south uh to perform at places like the newport folk festival and and some of the festivals or the festivals were really the the magnet for everybody that loved this music and it was all inclusive and there was a an element of the civil rights movement that cannot be ignored that was important to me growing up and um and got to hear all this amazing tapestry of American music and I was uh, originally the, the, the I, I loved AM commercial radio 
and then I'm <laughs> giving away my age here. FM was brand new when I started out with all this, but for the most part, we had commercial. I was a radio nut from the time I was very small, and you know, I'm some of, some of your uh, some of you folks who are watching might might remember what it was like to have a six transistor radio with the covers pulled over your head at night when your mother thought you were sleeping listening to the radio. But 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 the thing about having so few stations playing all the all the pop music was that you got to hear everything, and and um, if you if you liked Motown and you liked the folky stuff like I did, you had to listen through um, the Beatles and the British Invasion and all that stuff. And so so growing up in the city like that, you kind of got a just kind of an overarching uh, kind of smorgasbord of all these different styles. But the but the one that hit me in the head was Bob Dylan, among other things, and, and Doc Watson in the beginning because they made the music accessible to me. I mean, I I went from a listener to a to a player when I was in the fifth grade, and Dr. Billy Taylor came to my public school and put on a presentation, and that was the, and he enabled me to <laughs> to feel like I could do it myself. But but um, but it was it was really you know. Bob Dylan singing about things like that. At that age, I really didn't have enough life experience to understand, but just being so powerful with yeah. a wooden box with, with metal strings and just lyrics, you know. Right. It just made me want to do it. And, and uh, one thing led to another, and I, I tried to be Doc Watson for about six months before I realized that wasn't happening, but that was my entree to country music. And uh, Great. Doc. Doc. So when I got to college, I fell in with a with a bunch of people and went to jam sessions and got a job washing dishes in Johnny's Big Red Grill in Ithaca, New York, because that's where the sessions were happening. Ah, uh, Ithaca. There you go. There's a hot spot. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I went to Cornell for a couple of years and studied absolutely the wrong thing. And, <laughs> what was uh, that? I studied architecture and engineering, and, and I ended up working as an engineer for many years. I didn't play music professionally till I was 40. Hmm. But uh, but that was that was the kind of the beginning of the end. I met I met uh, members of the Highwood String Band because they were on the scene at that time, and and uh, and and it, the, the the whole old time thing was very very strong. There was get, uh, getting to be a strong connection between the the Northeast and and all these kind of Southern connections. And, right. Yeah. Uh, so so I wanted to be an old time musician. That was that was me. And, and so who who was the the um first southern old-time musician not a revivalist but you know who, who was the person that made you go oh my god listen to this <clears throat> uh, of the real old-time music i guess a lot of us used to sit around in ithaca listening to lps and right. tommy Jarrell was the one that popped up it was a there was an lp on on county records called down to the cider mill and it was him and fred cockrum and oscar jenkins playing this very weird style of finger style banjo right and uh, there was something I mean at that age you're you're not just looking for music you you're looking for you're looking to get your footing in life you know and there was a there was a this kind of romance that jumped out at me that said uh, you know I'd never been a country guy right but it just made me made me want to move to the country I can't tell you why so so did you after listening to those records did you have the opportunity to encounter any of those musicians or I ones did. like that yeah i did um <clears throat> i went to the galax fiddlers convention for the first time in 1974 and uh and got exposed to the scene and got to see a, a lot of these old timers who i'd only heard of and then shortly after that i i got to meet tommy gerald uh in person, I spent a little bit of time at his house, and um, and I, you know, I I visited, I got to see him from time to time. He was kind of my touchstone for this mm -hmm. music, but and a lot of the people in his community, um, he was from for for the listeners who might not know, he was from Surrey County, North Carolina, which is right by the Blue Ridge on the North Carolina side, and the, and the the music tradition there is really really strong and unique, and you can tell a tell the music from from there just as soon as you hear it and and um it just really resonated with me i started playing square dances and and uh <clears throat> yeah and it, that, that was kind of the beginning of the journey i started going south every year 
uh, to all these different festivals and eventually move there wow. to be around it. To North Carolina? Is that where you were? Uh, I moved to Lexington, Virginia. Lexington. There you go. Rockbridge yeah. County, Virginia. And, of course, there was a really strong scene of us transplanted urban kids. Right. And I've discovered there are a lot of people on the same journey as me, you know. They were just in the next car over on the music highway there. Right. And uh, so I, I, when I got there, I, we call it couch surfing now. But, uh, <laughs> right. I, I ended up uh, staying in a house with, uh, with Brad Lefwich and David Winston and Al Tharp, all whom became really good friends mm -hmm. um, over the years and great musicians. And, you know, we all went to the festivals. We had little bands together. Uh, Ace Weems and the Fat Meat Boys with James Leva. And, and, right. uh, and then eventually I encountered um, the, the, the Greengrass Cloggers, and that was a, a big step. In fact... For, for your viewing pleasure, Walt, I put up, you, you see behind me, it says chaos. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Those were bumper stickers that, that I think were given out or made by the Green Grass Cloggers years and years ago. There was that, and there was one that said ignorance with confidence. Right. And that was us. Yeah. For those of you who don't know about the Green Grass Cloggers, they, they were young people who um, encountered the same thing, this love of dance. They saw the dance related to this music and and they took it back to where, to its origins, which was people freestyling and not being, uh, you know, terribly regimented about their dancing. And um, they lit up a whole a whole world of, of, uh, of dance and people that weren't, the original teams were, I would say 90% from the North or from the South, but then Northern, folks got involved and the green grass cloggers became sort of you know everyone yeah yeah well they were they, once again they you know they they made it accessible they right made it dance accessible they were uh you know we were all at the age we were all so social and kind of into each other and and of course for me that was one of the best things that ever happened to me was meeting them because my wife audrey was a green grass clogger and that's how we met there you go uh, fell in love with a dancer 40 years later, here we are, you know. <laughs> wow. So so the, you know, your old time music thing happened and happened in a big way. Um, having said that, you're not, a lot of other musical influences have come into your playing and your your mindset. Tell us about how that happened and what you're what you're into. Well, uh, I, I'm, I wouldn't say I'm philosophical about it, but I kind of think about what music does. I think to be a musician it's not it's not just the how it's the why and the what and and uh and music is language that's the thing that you discover over time and at one point i got i had an opportunity um my first professional tour actually well even before that was was uh mick maloney great mm. uh irish american banjo player invited me to participate in a couple of uh saint patrick's day programs that he would put on every year one was at, uh, at Georgetown University in D.C., and the other was up in Philly. And it was a big collection of, of almost completely all Celtic music, you know, Irish musicians, and me. And, uh, and I got stuck on stage, and, and uh, stuck on st I got placed on stage <laughs> next to some great players, and I wasn't familiar with that scene. I still clearly remember um, wearing... Nick Ambler, who's who, amazing singer who sang with the group Dan, who's sitting to my left, and and just knocking my head off with her singing, and there was Billy McComsky, um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> great accordion player from who lives in lives in Baltimore, I guess now, and uh, Jimmy Keane from Chicago, and it opened a door for me, and I realized that there was commonality. I mean, here we are, common ground on the hill, man. I'm looking for common ground all the time, and and and. Uh, and it made me realize that this musical language that I had kind of absorbed for myself, this old time stuff, um, that I could maybe speak in another language with that accent. You know, so I started to collaborate. And um, a, a few years after that, I ended up on, a, on my first professional tour, which was called Fiddles on Fire. And it was uh, a collection of fiddlers from different countries and different traditions. And that was, that was the point, of, uh, that was when I really I jumped the shark 
for myself. Uh -huh. you know? And uh, the players that were on that tour uh, were all really well-established, great players. Uh, Kevin Burke, Alistair Frazier, Jean-Francois Rowe from France, um, uh, Chris Wood from England, who since then, he was a great fiddler. He's become a, a, a really well-respected songwriter. Um, and and uh, a, a duet from Sweden, Elika Frizzell and Mats Edien. Um, and I had never heard Swedish music in my life. I hope I'm not forgetting anybody. Alistair Anderson was the tour organizer, and of course he's a, a great concertine of, and, and uh, English musician. Yeah, the high he's from the high-level ranters. Right, right. Yeah. Oh, and Elika's South Indian violin teacher, uh, was a virtuoso. He passed away a few years ago, named K. Shiva Kumar. Hmm. So, if you can remember all of, if you can imagine all of us riding along in this little bus, um, it was really, it was really just eye-opening for me. And um, I ended up just kind of sticking my toe in a bunch of different styles, and uh, and playing. Uh, you know, I I started touring in Sweden and had some. I mean, I could list. I, I'm the luckiest guy in the world for all the collaborations I've had with, mm. with uh, Nordic and you know Finnish and Swedish and Norwegian and Danish musicians. Um, it's uh, yeah. I, I don't I don't take it, uh, any of it for granted, and I've made some great friends. Um, yeah, it's it's. Um, yeah, I've had a few of those experiences, and that you know, the camaraderie that happens. It's just it just happens because. Mm -hmm. I guess you're playing at a certain level that you can hear each other and and you also know if you're there and they're there they're there because they did something that got them there and what they did was play good music and yeah. Yeah, and then there's that they connection moved, they had to be moved by something to get right. there. it's not just you know some of them uh come from musical families uh, some of them were you know we were all inspired by some way I have no cultural claim to the music I play I just love it you know that's that's right. enough for me, you know. Yeah. Uh, Alistair Fraser was one of my, my. Uh, I always blame him and give him credit for for pushing me into doing this full time because I was a mechanical engineer for many years and I mm -hmm. jumped ship and went full time to music. He was a, a physicist for British Petroleum. Is that right? And did the same thing earlier in his career, and and he was a he was inspiration to me. Um, yeah, for those of you who don't know Alistair Fraser, he's a great Scottish fiddler, and. Uh, it's funny, we were playing in Scotland uh, in Stirling hmm. and uh, for the Stirling Folk Club. <clears throat> and his parents came up to Frank Orsini, who was playing fiddle in our group, mm -hmm. and, and said, yeah, our, our, our son plays the fiddle, you know. But it wasn't like our son is Alistair Fraser. It was, yeah, our son plays the fiddle, right. you know. And, and they got talking and, this, and Frank, politely said well who's your son so uh, Alistair Fraser <laughs> oh my god but, but that's that's also a, a, a point about all this is that um, in your hometown in, in the tradition that you come from you're not necessarily seen as um, something uh, special right it's just something that happens in that community and it's sort of outside when you step outside and and go you know go with your music or your art or whatever it is Right. You put it out there. That's the point at which, uh, you know, maybe you even have a different view of yourself. But the folks at home remember you as the kid that mowed the lawn every Saturday. Right? Or, yeah, or charged them 25 cents to shovel their car out of their parking spot in the, in the snow. That's right. That was me. I That's had right. A, in, in the Bronx, I had a, a, a newspaper delivery route, which was one 22-story apartment building. And I collect my <laughs> papers and I go up to the top every day after school and just make my way all the way down to the bottom. And then I was done. <laughs> nice. That's a good one. Well, yeah, I, I like to tell the story of my, my grandmother who always used to say to me, she was from Southern Illinois, but uh, she was um, married to my grandfather, who was a, a, uh, he was the chief auditor of the national geographic. So that they were like displaced country people in DC. And she would always say to me, when are you going to get a real job? You know? <laughs> and, and one day, I, this was pretty close to when she died. She was uh, upstairs in our house and I heard this piano being played. 
Uh-huh. And I went up there and she was playing like country dance piano, like backup piano. And I said, when, when did this happen? She says, oh, I used to play for those old fiddlers uh-huh. back in Illinois when she was a girl. And, but she never talked about it. And that, that's how these traditions, I think, live, you know, while the world grows and does whatever it's trying to do, trying to evolve, these, these, these little gems still live on and, and yeah. sometimes they're very quiet. Well, we, we were lucky that we've had people, that certainly in my scene, who were smart enough to do oral histories, mm-hmm. you can call them oral histories or at least document with some of these older musicians to see where they'd been, you know? Right. Um, people like Alice Gerard, who I know you know. Sure. Um, did a huge amount of, of uh, photographing of all these old musicians, and she's been kind of going through that stuff recently, and, and you know, just the kind of the memories it evokes. There's a guy on Facebook named Dave Wells who took a whole bunch of videos of the Fiddler's Conventions between 1987 and 90 or 91. Hmm. Um, just jam sessions or, yep. or you know, uh, contest performances, and he's been sticking them up on Facebook all the time. And uh, they're, it, it's just, it's great to see that stuff. Yeah, it's interesting how we're, we're so better connected. And one thing that's happened here, um, you may not, may not be aware of, is that we were named the Folk Life Center for Mid Maryland. Ah, congratulations. Uh, yeah, which is. Carroll County, Frederick County, and Howard County. Mm-hmm. And um, part of, uh, of our mission is to document. So we're doing a lot of that. In fact, this oh, concert will become part of our archive. So nice. hey, you're a mid-Maryland uh, legend now. Oh, I'm, pr- <laughs> I'm proud. I'm proud to be in the club. Thank well, you. Let, I will, um, I'll get out of the way so you can play some more great music, but I wanted to remind folks, remember to go to the comments and donate. Um, to Bruce's efforts here, to his music. And um, Bruce, we look forward to having you in real time uh, again. Um, Absolutely. We, we miss all the great folks who've been playing music with us. And, uh, but this is the best way to do it now. And uh, you all be sure to share this. Let people know um, that you saw this on YouTube and tell more people about it. It's a great way to hear and see Bruce. And, uh, well, it's, it's great to see you all. And thank, thanks to everybody for for joining and uh yeah here we go rosin up that bow we'll see you later all righty bye-bye okay bye-bye i hope you're all enjoying yourselves having a good time i'm grateful to uh to common ground for having me for this show and uh as you can tell it's being pre-recorded and i'm just sitting here watching all the meters and cameras and just assuming that it's going to get onto those devices and that you're going to hear it. I guess we'll find out here at the end. Uh, Let's see. Get this old guitar and tune it into the very, very rare tuning of standard. that uh, cassettes are coming back. It kind of cracks me up a little bit. And it's fine because I have boxes of them laying all over this office. You only get to see the neat part of my office right here. The train wreck part is the part that's off camera. But uh, in the previous lifetime of cassettes, we used to pass cassettes around with interesting music kind of galvanized our music community and I love I love blues guitar I love Delta blues and and ragtime music and and all that kind of stuff here's a piece that is kind of my take on something recorded by a man named Little Hat Jones bye bye baby bye bye Bye-bye. Bye, 
bye-bye, little girl, bye-bye. If I don't see you no more, God bless you everywhere you go. stop on this trip and play this old guitar this was made in 1926 so it reserves the right to not stay in tune for more than about five minutes at a time Um, about 1999 or 2000, I had the, the honor of playing at the Smithsonian Folklife Festival with my band at that time, Big Hoedown. And, um, and we met one of the beauty parts of that festival was musicians from all over the world bringing different uh, music, food ways, textiles, everything. And I got to meet an indigenous people um, from, uh, from Peru called Huinos, and uh, these, their language is Quechua, and they play this beautiful, beautiful dance music. Usually this next piece I, I learned from a recording, and it's it's meant to be played on the accordion and guitaron, I guess, but uh, but I just kind of adapted the adapted the melody to uh, the fingerstyle guitar, because I had to. And uh, it's told, called Tostando Cancha, which I'm told means toasting coconut. Thank you. 
Thank you. I know you're out there somewhere. So let's see what we got next on the program. I think uh, I think I'll get my fiddle back again and play you a set of tunes that's mostly. Mostly from Scandinavia. Well, that's the intent. Um, or I should say the Nordic countries, because as, as it's explained to me, Finland is not part of, part of the Scandinavian nations, but it is a, um, a Nordic country. And um, I spent time in several of those countries, and they're all really, really beautiful. Um, so I'm going to play you one tune. I'm going to retune a string to do it. And it was written by Magnus Stinnerbaum, a great fiddler and composer. And uh, from Sweden. transitions right I'm gonna play um, after that I'm gonna play you a tune from Finland that I learned from my friend Arto Jarvola and Arto is a fantastic fiddler on his own plays Kantola and and uh, is a real scholar on Finnish music and comes from a musical family from the Kaustinen region if you ever have the opportunity to go to the Kaustinen Fest folk festival it's phenomenal and really far away and the third tune uh, for no apparent reason that I think it just fits in the set, is one that I that I learned from my from uh, Alistair Fraser, and heard later on the great late Jerry Holland play. It's a Cape Breton tune. It's called Molly Rankin. So here's an un unlikely set of of uh, Nordic Cape Breton tunes. <laughs>
those Cape Breton melodies. I've got a few more on the on the list for you tonight. I hope it's okay. I'm having a wonderful time here in my office. I'd be having a more, one more wonderful time if I was there with you. But there with you is a lot of different places, I'm afraid. <laughs> so um, <clears throat> here's a piece that I'm just going to sing unaccompanied. Uh, and it was written by a, a great musician, songwriter, band member, pal. His name is Craig Johnson. And it's a, it's a little bit of history about World War II and what they called the Hillbilly Highway. <clears throat> and it's called A Way Down the Road. I remember back in 33 when we were still in Tennessee. Just getting by took all your time away down the road. Then the word went out in 41 and Uncle Sam said get the big job done. And we all hired out on Willow Run away down the road. Blow your whistle up through the pines and out across the mountains and the Clinchfield line. Blow for better times away down the road. Well, we come from the hills and the damn coal mines started into working on Henry's lines. Eight hours steady and overtime away down the road. But the folks up north didn't want us round. They moved us out to the edge of town. Shoebox houses on the bulldozed ground away down the road. Blow your whistle up through the pines and out across the mountains in the Clinchfield line. Blow for better times away down the road. We was strong backs bending in the welder's light. Rivet guns pounding on a windy night. A rich man's war and a poor man's fight away down the road. Oh, you punch in, punch out, make your time, and steady with the turret, boys, you're getting behind. And the bombers roared out o'er the blacked-out skies away down the road. Blow your whistle up through the pines and out across the mountains and the Clinchfield line. Blow for better times away down the road. Well, you're trying to pay the rent, man, trying to save a buck. Patching up the tires on your wore-out truck. While all the city folks pass with all their hay can tuck. Away down the road. Oh, we'll move back south when the war gears down. But your dreams die easy when your check comes round. And you're caught between the mountains and a factory town. Away down the road. Blow your whistle up through the pines and out across the mountains in the Clinchfield line. Blow for better times away down the road. Now the plants have shut down, the gates all closed. The new cars rust in the rain and snow. Let me sleep where the gun stick laurel grows away down the road. You can bury me back in Tennessee. He lived for a dollar, let my tombstone read. Died unknown in a strange country, away down the road. Blow your whistle up through the pines and out across the mountains in the Clinchfield line. Blow for better times, away down the road. Blow your whistle up through the pines and out across the mountains in the Clinchfield line. Blow for better times away down the road. Thank you, Craig Johnson. Well, speaking of Kentucky, Clyde Davenport was highly revered fiddle player and not quite as many people know what a great banjo player he was. He played this next tune on both instruments, not at the same time, of course. And uh, just an old-time dance tune. If you haven't already done so, please roll up the rug. Watch out for the cat. It's a little bit of uh, five miles from town. Thank you. 
five miles from town. Well, folks, I hope you've enjoyed yourself as much as I have. Miss you all. Hope you're taking care, being safe, doing the right thing, listening to science, wearing a mask out of love and respect for your neighbors and your family. I'm going to tune up here and um, play one last little bit of music. And while I'm tuning... Tuning is a risk here. Um, I want to say big, huge thanks to, to Walt Michael, to Maria Wang, for being so incredibly wonderful to work with and generous. And uh, and to you all for stopping by. I know that Walt mentioned there is a there is a tip jar. If you've enjoyed it and you're up for it and you can do it, it's it's most appreciated. If you're into learning this sort of music, especially the old time stuff on fiddle and banjo, I do teach some workshops through Cafe Lena in Saratoga Springs and uh, also through the great website called Peghead Nation where we offer tunes every month, a new one every month, a new old one every month. Social media, all those places we are out there. Come check us out on Facebook and Instagram and but for this last tune a set of tunes from yet another unlikely border country that'll be the region between um, Finland and North Carolina so I'll say uh, Thank you once again, and um, take care, stay in touch, and I hope to see you for real one of these days soon. So here's the three mark Polska followed by Down the Road. Down the road, down the road, I got a sugar 
again. Stay safe once again. See you later. Thank you, Common Ground. Bye-bye. Hi, folks. Wasn't that a great concert? Bruce Molsky, we're so uh, thankful to him for being part of our concert series. And again, you know, uh, check out our other concerts here on the YouTube channel, Common Ground on the Hill, official YouTube channel, and share this information with your friends. It's a real treasure trove of great music and art. Uh, this video, of course, will live uh, into the future and be sure once again to look there in the comments as to how you can uh, uh, donate to help Bruce and other musicians. Again, all of the donations go entirely to the musicians. So thanks for tuning in and uh, keep your eye open on our YouTube channel and Facebook and the Common Ground on the Hill website, commongroundonthehill.org to see what's next. There are a lot of great surprises ahead. See you soon.